Well, we're learning more only in the past couple of hours about really what led up to the officer firing his gun, but this is where it all went down. I mean, there's debris scattered all over the place. I know it's kind of dark, but you can see there's wood here. This looks like it could be some kind of like siding or maybe some sort of roofing. And this car right here, from what it looked like, it looked like someone was trying to sell it. I figured I would show you the way he taught me. He said, really, it's best if you do about four scoops of sand. This is where the fire all went down. I'm on the back side of the building. It's where a lot of the greenhouses are. Those were the things that were on fire last night. And Amanda in McCanda. McCanda. Nice ring to that, Amanda. It rhymes. I like it. I like it. That's why y'all sent me here, right? Well, it's been months and months of preparation. The day is finally here. There's so much excitement surrounding this eclipse. Officials tell us that they closed last Thanksgiving and the response was so great. They said, hey, we're going to do it again. Now, I just spoke with fire officials on the scene. They have confirmed to me that one person did not survive this fire. Really just a tragic morning out here. Several big stories today at noon. We start with news about former Perry County coroner Herb Miller. You may have seen the alert on your phone. Miller now faces a new charge of theft. This according to the Missouri Attorney General's office, and this really changes things. Now there will be a hearing to revoke Miller's bond and send him to prison. The Attorney General's office is also pursuing a civil case against Miller. They want anyone who bought a pre need funeral plan payable to Miller to call their office in Jefferson City. This update from Bollinger County. Everything is fine now with the county's emergency and non emergency phone system. We told you a few days ago about how they've been having some problems, but today both the sheriff and Big River Telephone says that the problem is fixed and everything is good to go. Bollinger County's presiding county commissioner told us on Tuesday that apparently there was some sort of problem when the county switched from AT&T over to Big River. More news coming in at noon. First, though, another cloudy day in downtown Cape, but I can't say a bit warmer than yesterday. Brian Allworth standing by with your first alert forecast. Hey, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Well, no more burn bans in Scott and Pulaski counties. Both are lifting burn orders since the ground's not as dry now. Again, that's Scott County in Missouri and Pulaski in southern Illinois. Cape Girardeau County has also lifted a burn ban, so good news to hear. Meanwhile, the death toll in those northern California wildfires is at least 23. Many are still missing. Nearly two dozen wildfires are burning out of control in California's wine country. So far, the fires have destroyed 35 homes and businesses. Just awful. Well, today, President Trump signed an executive order that he calls Obamacare relief. He says it'll make cheaper health insurance more readily available. Lola Lingi reports more about it. The Trump administration has taken other steps to limit Obamacare, including cutting in half the open enrollment period, which begins November 1st, and also slashing the Obamacare advertising and outreach budget. President Donald Trump is also criticizing hurricane ravaged Puerto Rico in several tweets just this morning. He says the government can't keep federal aid there forever. He says there is a total lack of accountability and electric and all infrastructure was a disaster before the hurricanes. Police emergency. The, the longest response, probably two minutes. It's a service that's not used often. It's very rare. But if something were to happen, they know they're there. It's an added level of security. The student watch and escort service, also known as SWES, provides an option at night to get students from point A to point B safe. But it's not often utilized. I'd say in a semester's time, we may get two calls for a SWES. Captain Ken Gullett attributes the decline to the addition of the shuttle service that runs until 2 a.m. The uh, use drastically went down. At one time, student volunteers ran the service. The student volunteers, you know, finally disbanded in a sense, uh, just due to the lack of, of, um, of use. But now officers handle the task. The officer will meet the student and uh, and shadow them. In addition to the SWES program, Captain Gullett says if you're on campus late at night, plan ahead. Do not walk alone. Make sure you're aware of your surroundings and keep your cell phone and car keys handy so you can get to them fast. As a campus police officer, no matter where you're at, you have a responsibility to your students and to their families of you know, making sure your students are safe. It all started with, you know, really it started with SWES being the first level of added security to this campus. 
my left leg and foot would like drag. Feel okay? Yes. Well, I didn't go to the doctor immediately, you know, because I because it was getting better. I thought I got the wear this week. It looks like I've never been sick in my life. Little did Beverly Johnson know that a trip to the doctor and several tests would change her life forever. Beverly was diagnosed in July with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, better known as ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease. But not even a month after her diagnosis. Mary, you ready? I'm ready. She can start hooking me up. Beverly is now on the ground floor of a brand new treatment for ALS. This is the first thing that's came out for ALS in 22 years, I was told. She's the first in southeast Missouri to receive the drug. It's all about timing, I guess. It's called Radicava. It's administered through an infusion. This is my second round of treatment. It's an eight week treatment cycle with two weeks off between each round of infusions and then repeats. It's a grueling treatment that Beverly would receive for the rest of her life. I don't think I'm as tired. Maybe. Dr. Andrew Godby is overseeing Beverly's care. The hope is that it helps de it decreases the um, progression of ALS. He says this new drug is huge for those fighting the nervous system disease. It was just made available to patients in August. Right now the studies show it was just six months trial. So it's just starting to come out and we're going to see we're going to have more data on it. You know, over time we'll see how our patients fare. Um, with it longer term. So there's no telling what this drug could mean for patients long term. Dr. Godby says there are only two FDA approved treatments for ALS, Radicava now being one of them. So patients now have another option, but with a drug being so new. The drug companies are still trying to figure out, you know, who, who they're going to pay for. Uh, the drug itself is about $146,000 a year. Not all insurance companies will cover it, leaving some patients unable to afford it. Beverly feels lucky. They have not balked my insurance and it was right on it. While Beverly will have to continue this treatment for the rest of her life. Maybe just to maintain what I have and able to do uh, what I'm doing right now for myself. She's optimistic and wants to encourage others. Don't give up. I, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of people getting this. It just takes time. Julia narrowed his eyes. Books spark our imagination. I like that. That's exactly what I would have drawn. They teach us things. And like life, they take us on a journey. I started this conversation with God. I asked him to reveal me to me. But you don't always get to choose your path. Okay. You see, this time last year, Janet Wigfall was not in the classroom, but in the middle of breast cancer treatment. I lifted a stack of books or boxes and I bumped my chest and I thought, oh. At first, she brushed it off, but when it happened again a few weeks later. I thought, okay, I guess that muscle, I really strained that muscle. So um, maybe I better get this checked out just in case, rule it out. There had never been breast cancer in my family, never diagnosed mine. I had religiously had my mammograms. A trip to the doctor, two screenings, and an ultrasound later. It's about 8 o'clock, early May. We were all set up to do the MAP testing with our kids, and the phone rang. Her doctor delivered her diagnosis, triple negative breast cancer. I remember asking, could it shorten my life? And she said, yes. And I remember picking up a friend going, okay, I got my diagnosis. It's cancer and I don't want to do this. And the friend said, yes, you can. Janet is a woman of faith. And to say her diagnosis was a prayer answered might seem strange. Once I received the diagnosis and I kind of got over that, like, whoa, okay, this is real. Life is getting ready to change. Once I got to that point, um, I said to God, okay, I asked you for this. You answered my prayer. Now teach me how to do this. What did God teach you? God said, you need to let people know. So she did. And with her world spinning, that's when the love began to pour in. My phone was ringing constantly with people asking how they could help. From meals to people sitting with her through treatments, Janet felt God was planting seeds in her life to help guide her through. There was never a time that I felt alone or not lifted up in prayer. And you have people almost waiting in line just to serve and to help me. 
It was overwhelming in a good kind of way. And when chemo kept her out the first few weeks of school last year, her school family made sure that she felt the love her first day back to work. When I got out of the car, oh my goodness, uh, and I still, and in the parking lot, and I started seeing all of these pink shirts. I, that's where I, I kind of lost it. And when I walked in, there was just a sea of pink shirts that support just made me cry. Well, why do you think I drew this? So this year, while it may seem simple to some. Now that's yeah. really good. Did anyone else draw the stairs? Sitting with her kids in class the first few weeks of school is symbolic of her journey. Tiger strong. Um, my motto has always been to walk into the hardness and let God lead you through it. Walk into it and just walk through it. Janet says that she is in remission and just hopes her story can help those either just learning their diagnosis or currently going through treatment. With this month's Peak Up Report, I'm Amanda Hansen. The Show Me State has one of the largest systems of roads and bridges, but they're ranked 47th when it comes to funding. MoDOT officials really, they're trying to do what they can to stay afloat, but it leaves some feeling a bit uneasy. I would rather not drive across it. Linda Holler is concerned. I feel like the bridge kind of shakes when you go across it. She's talking about this one lane bridge on Highway 51 just outside of Zelma, Missouri, built in 1929. It was a long time ago. 88 years of wear and tear. I realize that he has a lot of character and some people would say it's uh, the epitome of that time, but uh, I feel like that we need an update bad. But after years of trying to get MoDOT to do something about the bridge. I just kind of gave up, you know, you, you feel like that, you know, how often do you have to do this and you don't get anywhere. It's a challenge MoDOT struggles with daily. It's, it's kind of a zero sum game. MoDOT is responsible for maintaining nearly 10,400 bridges. 60% are still standing beyond the intended lifespan. We'll go look at it. David Wyman handles the Southeast District. See, see where all that is spalled off. So to give you a little background here, bridges are inspected on a scale of one to nine. The higher the number, the better the condition. If it goes below a three, it's shut down. We'll take this hammer and just make sure that they're all solid. Bridges are inspected typically every two years and annually if it's advanced in age. Inspectors look at three specific areas. The substructure are what goes into the ground like the posts, the superstructure, which would be the beams that go across, and the roadway deck itself. During the winter, we put down salt to melt the ice and the snow and that will come down through there and rust that rebar. So that's what that looks like. He says MoDOT is replacing bridges at a good rate, but they're dropping into poor condition at the same rate. That's a problem. How do you get ahead? Uh, you have to spend more money. But that's easier said than done. It's hard because there are so many competing interests uh, for funding. The one thing about transportation is it affects so many people. Just think about how many bridges you cross every single day. To break it down, MoDOT gets 50% of its funding from the state fuel tax, 25% from licensing fees like when you renew your driver's license, and the remaining 25% comes from the sales tax on vehicles. We're spending more than we're, we're taking in. It's just like, again, just like your home budget. I mean, uh, we've got a reserve. We had built up a reserve. That reserve was, was necessary, but we are spending down that reserve in order to keep our expenditures up high enough to take care of our system. It seems inflation is the biggest obstacle with the cost of things like concrete, asphalt, and steel. Some of their biggest needs all going up. So to counter that... Our maintenance forces have to spend a lot of time out here working on this bridge, patching potholes and doing things like that. So this is a, an instance where we feel like we need to program this bridge for some work so that we can eliminate the, the maintenance concerns and the maintenance call outs. Which helps to save the bottom dollar. What is causing this bridge to have problems is the bridge deck itself. They're also integrating new techniques. One of the things that we're doing now is we're uh, putting epoxy coated paint on the rebar that we put in our new bridge decks. 
and so we're, you know, it's kind of one of those things that we, we feel like it's going to increase the lifespan of it. Only time will tell, but if a bridge can hold up 80 plus years with construction techniques from the 1930s, there's no telling what this can do. One of the highest places overlooking the river. As for Linda, the bridge has been uh, like a dam. She's still holding out hope for a new bridge over Castor River. I wouldn't want to call them out on it, but I would like to present it again for their consideration. So, uh, and, and did I ask them several times and did I have them down here? Yes. I did check with MoDOT about the future plans of the Castor River Bridge over Highway 51. He did tell me, Wyman told me that the bridge is safe and that they do have plans in place for a replacement bridge by 2020. For now, live in Cape Girardeau, Amanda Hansen, Heartland News.